So then, in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. This is a day of new considerations. You know, that we are in a, a battle of the faith. We mentioned now the battle of the faith and talking about faith and heresy uh, yesterday. And that uh, we're in the battle of the church against the world. The church is, is being attacked very heavily in the world today. And there are two few considerations now about one of the simple aspects of the faith, faith which is our daily keeping of the faith. You know, our daily keeping of the faith, I mentioned yesterday, for instance, how the purpose of the priest is to help people make it possible for them to please God. And to be able to please God, it's without faith it's impossible to please God. So faith is necessary to please God. And the priest just teach a situation, a, a, an environment to be able to please God, and that's an environment in which we receive the teaching of the faith, and an environment in which we receive the sacraments, by which we receive sanctifying grace in the faith. A normal environment, a normal place where these faith is kept, both by its preaching and by its reception of the sacraments, is called the parish. And the parish is, like the, is like, kind of like the family structure of the Catholic Church. That in the, just like in a society, in a society you have perfect, there are two perfect societies, the church and the state. And the church and the state are the two perfect societies. It's an imperfect society, which is called the family. Imperfect means incomplete. So the imperfect family, the society, the family, for instance, can never fulfill its purpose as human beings on its own. So the family, for instance, it is not the father is not able to take care of the family unless he's able to work, unless he's able to communicate with other human beings around him, and able to get things outside the home and bring them into the home. So if there isn't a place outside the home or a society above him, he can't function. And the, the mother and the father, when they have their children, the children, they're going to grow up one day. And when they grow up, what's going to happen? They're going to have to enter into society. And they're going to have to build, uh, be a part of the building of society. So they're going to be, make new families. They're going to become leaders of society or subjects in society. And so the family is an imperfect organization which is like, a, like the bricks or the blocks of the wall of the state or the bricks and the blocks of the wall of the church. And so without the bricks and the blocks, of course, you don't have a wall, but a brick by itself and a block by itself is useless. So that the brick and the block is, belongs to a wall. It belongs to a house. It belongs to a church. It belongs to a city. And so that the, the and that there's and that these bricks and blocks have to be part of society. So there's a small part of society, which is the village or the town, which is the average place in which uh, a normal family dwells. And then there's a, and then and then the town is connected to the rest of the society. We belong to this country. We belong to this king. We belong to this set of rules. We have this kind of language that we speak. So that we speak one language, the people in the next country may speak a different language. So the family is a building block, and it must fit within the society. And so it must fit within the society of the state, but it also must fit within the society of the church. And in the society of the church, the main little village or where, the, where the, the, the families reside is called the parish. It is a place where they go and receive the teaching of the faith, and the place where they go and receive the sacraments, baptism, confirmation, we're united in holy matrimony. And then, of course, obviously the sacrament of extreme unction cannot be received at the church. So the, church the priest goes out from the church to the place of the person that's dying to give them the sacrament of extreme unction. And then, of course, the burial. And the burial is normally going to be in a church and in, in a, in a, in a near and related in some way to the parish. So there's normally a parish church, and then outside of the parish church is a cemetery, and then there's the uh, school, and just nearby the parish church somewhere. But the parish is the, in, in a complete parish, a parish that's got all, in, all, the, all the bells and whistles. But the essence of the parish is the place where the priest gives the faith. That's the first thing. That's the first essential part of the parish, because in the beginning of many parishes, in the past, there were not even masses. They were not able to say masses all the time. So that, but always there was the preaching of the faith. And then, secondly, the mass. And then, from the preaching of the faith and the mass, then all the things that flow from that. Baptism and confirmation. And then marriages. And then the, uh, you know, the, the, the preservation of the faith. Then the parish belongs to the diocese. And it belongs to the larger, larger part of the church. 
so that when the young men and the young ladies pass through the parish, when they get older, they can go out to other places. They can also go and join the priesthood or the religious life, become monks or sisters. And then from, from this, this, this is, the, this is the, a society. It's a small society. The parish is a small society, which is a part of a bigger society, which is the diocese, which is a part of a bigger society to which, which, which it belongs, which is the Holy Roman Catholic Church, the mystical body of Christ. And then remember, the mystical body of the Christ has continual communication one part with another. Just like in our own body, I know, I mean, every few seconds, the blood goes out of the body, goes all the way through the entire body, and comes back. It's moving with great speed through the entire body. So that the toe has a communion with the head, and the head has a communion with the toe, and the, and the fingers, etc. There's a constant communication back and forth. The heart is constantly communicating to the entire body, and that's the state. And the head is constantly communicating to the entire body, and that is the church. The head is always uh, communicating what the fingers and what the toes and what the, uh, the various parts of the body are to do. And, and then the heart is giving strength to all these things, to, be, to all the parts of the body to do their, their bidding. And meanwhile, the body is sending forth by the veins all of its worn out parts, etc., back to the heart to be reoxygenated and, and to be refed, and then back out to the body. And there's a constant communion back and forth. Now, our, the society of the Catholic Church is a human society. And St. Thomas Aquinas points out that we as human beings, we are social creatures. We are not uh, uh, creatures that are meant to be alone. It's not that way with many of the animals. Amongst the animals, for instance, you'll find some animals, like if a mommy snake meet, meets her baby snake, she eats it. If, as men, when, when a little bitty and some of the other animals, when they're born, once they're born, they're ready to go. They just simply go. The, the, the mommy lays the eggs, the, the daddy and mommy die, the eggs are hatched, and the little baby goes off and does his own thing and has no need of mommy and daddy, in many cases of the animals. So, but it, not always are they social. Not always are they connected one to another, and also they don't learn. For instance, the beaver doesn't learn how doesn't go to dam making school. The beaver doesn't have to learn how to make a dam. He knows how to make it. The bird doesn't know how, doesn't learn from his daddy how to make a nest. It's built into their instincts. But God made us human beings to be creatures of society, and the reason is because in the book of Genesis He said, "Let us make man into our own image and likeness." Let us make man to our own image and likeness, which is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Three that are one. God, no, there is, the Father cannot be without the Son. The Son cannot be without the Father. And the Holy Ghost can't be without the Father and the Son. And they, they, cannot, they are always together. And there's no Father without a Son, no Son without a Father, no Holy Ghost without the Father and the Son. So when God made the human society, He made it social in order to imitate that continual circumlocution or circumincession it's called in the, by the theologians the continual going around in circles of the blessed trinity the father, the son, holy ghost constantly interacting with each other and so the human beings need other human beings to be human just like if their father is without the son there is no God if the father is without the holy ghost there is no God wherever there is God there is father, son and holy ghost so in order to imitate this in human beings he made us social creatures so that we can never be fully a man we can never be fully human without society. And so the, the society is a grouping of human individuals. And, it's, and, and in that society, there's a head, and there's the heart, and there's the members. And every society has these elements, whether it be the society of uh, you know, a group that is uh, uh, for, for building cars, is there a, the Ford Automotive Corporation, there's a head of the corporation, there's members of the corporation, there's rules how the corporation operates, or whether it be a football club, or a basketball club, or, or a club of uh, uh, how to play cards, a card playing club, there's going to be rules of the club, when the club meets, and how the things how things happen in the club, and these things are determined in a natural way. There's a hierarchy, there's a head, and there's members, and so on. And in the Catholic Church, one of the divine teachings about our Catholic Church is how does the hierarchy of the Church work? In other organizations, there are other possibilities. There can be democratic organizations, uh, there can be uh, oligarchical organizations, or aristarchical or, or, or organizations, uh, but there, there, and there can be hierarchical, or, and all of course have to be hierarchical, but how does the hierarchy put together? The Catholic Church is a monarchical society. 
And, uh, but it does not have a monarchy of heredity, which was the case kind of in the Old Testament, amongst the priesthood and in the religious life. But it is, that is a hierarchy that's a spiritual hierarchy in which the priesthood is passed on by one pope. And one pope dies, another pope is elected, one the bishop before he dies, ordains another man a bishop, or consecrates another man a bishop, ordains another man a priest, and so on. The Catholic Church continues. And the building block of that society is the parish. And it's a natural order that the building block of a society be the parish. Now, in normal, healthy times, you've got St. Joseph's Parish and St. Vincent's Parish and St. Anne's Parish, and they're connected to the Diocese of Adelaide or they're connected to the Diocese of New York City or the Diocese of Paris, the Diocese of London, whatever diocese it is, all over the world. And there is a, the bishop sets up this parish, that parish, another parish. What happens when we have a crisis? What happens when there's a crisis in the church, such as happened in the Arian crisis 1,600 years ago, and many other local heretical crises that have happened uh, where, the, where the Catholics have been kicked out of their parishes, out of the physical buildings, and out of their normal parishes, like under communism and so on. And what, what happens now in our present crisis in which we are not able to go to the St. Joseph Parish and the St. Vincent Parish and the St. Anne's Parish and so on. We're not able to go to those parish churches because, unfortunately, they're teaching heresy which is the death of our faith and makes it impossible for us to please God. Therefore, we can have nothing to do with that. And they're leading souls astray, even though they might be good-intentioned priests and good-intentioned people that are there, many of them, they are still teaching a gospel different than the one handed down to us by God, by our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, because of these reasons of faith, we have to say, I'm sorry, but we can't be involved in St. Vincent Parish, St. Joseph Parish, and so on. Because of the faith. Now then, what happens? Does this mean that there is now no structure or no order in the church? The divine order remains. There still must be priests. There still must be bishops. There still must be parishes. And parishes are still places where the people gather together, being preached to by the priest, in order receiving the Holy Roman Catholic faith, receive the sacraments, baptism and confirmation and so on, and the Holy Eucharist and confession, and they receive the sacraments, some of them, the, 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 and they belong to this parish under the priest. The priest is still under the diocese, like as we mentioned each time in the case of the Society of St. Pius X and all traditional priests, that we are still operating under the bishop. For instance, here the Bishop of Adelaide. The Bishop of Adelaide, we pray for during the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, and that the and the, the the Bishop of whatever the local diocese is, we pray for the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, and we're truly connected to that Bishop before God. Oh, because of the necessity of our crisis, we cannot obey him uh, in in the practical decrees, but because of the necessity of the crisis of faith. However, we're still under him. We're still operating as a parish, and the parish does not not what is not the parish is not determined by the building, by the uh, what do you call it, uh, the, who owns the building, who, who owns the place of the Mass, etc. But it's, it's determined by the divine hierarchy. You've got Pope, Bishop, Priest, Faithful. This is the order of the Church. And the way the Church is able to spread is by the priest teaching the faithful. So when the priests come and teach the faithful, the priest is the one who has the authority in the, di in, in the parish. So when we we'll go around with this priest of the Society of St. Pius X, establishing parishes throughout the world, we establish these parishes as parishes. Now it's true that technically speaking we shouldn't use the term parish because parish is a technical canonical term that refers to an, a canonically erected uh, place, not necessarily a physical place, but uh, uh, a society, because they don't always have a building, under the bishop and so the bishop says, all right, these, this section of 12 miles by 12 miles is St. Joseph Parish. And whoever lives in this parish, this area, 12 miles by 12 miles, belongs to St. Joseph Parish. And Father Bob is the, is the pastor of St. Joseph Parish. And, that the, and so that it's just always an area. And then usually there's going to be at some point a church building built somewhere in that area. Or it's going to be like in the United States and maybe here also before, there will be a, a parish which will have two sides. It will be a 12, mile, a 12 mile area and all the Germans go to the German parish of St. Boniface. All, all of the Irish in that, in that area, they go to the Irish church of St. Patrick's and so on. And so that the Irish who live in this 12 mile by 12 mile area go to St. Patrick's Church. The Germans who live in this 12 mile by 12 mile area, they go to St. Boniface Church. 
And so that there are two churches in the same area, two pastors of the same area, designated by the bishop, but there's not a conflict between the pastors because one is the German pastor for all the Germans who live in that area, and the other is the Irish pastor for all the Irish who live in that area. And these are the, the personal parishes. Now, these are the normal parishes. And so the, the personal or territorial parishes are always going to be connected together. Now, we, those are the technical term parish. But there are many times when we have groupings of Catholics together under a priest, independent priest or priest of the diocese or priest of the missionary priest, like, for instance, in the missions, the Dominicans, Franciscans, uh, etc., they never had actual parishes until they became dioceses. So in their mission territories, they weren't yet dioceses. So they, had, they established missions, and they called them missions and not parishes. People still use the term parish because they look the same. But technically, it's true, technically, you call one a mission, you call the other a parish. But in the mission, the priest in charge of the mission is the priest in charge of the mission. And he runs the mission exactly the same as the pastor runs the parish. The only difference is the bishop has not designated a specific area or a specific group of people within a specific area uh, as his people, and he's not under the ordinary jurisdiction in that way. So, but, so the missions, when the missions are established, the priests go into California, like Junipero Cerro, or the St. John Burrito goes into India, goes to Tamil Nadu, he, stab, he goes into a place, he says, all right, this looks, like a good plot, this looks like a good place for a building, for a church. They throw up a bamboo hut. Well, we're going to have Mass in your place, and you know, we're going to have Mass in, you know, Mr. Uh, you know, Kumar Aswami's uh, place. And so they're going to have the Mass there. They establish the mission. The people gather around the mission. The priest preaches. The priest gives them the baptism. The priest says, all right, I'm going to be at this mission. I'm going to try to be here in the past, for instance, our sister Lefebvre, who was a missionary priest. Some of his missions he could visit only once every two years, and then sometimes once a year. And then occasionally it could be more than once a year. And then some, some missions even had priests very regularly, once a month or even every week. And some missions even had daily mass. So as the missions would expand, some missions once a year, some missions once every two years. They always tried to get to a mission within two years. That was the old Jesuit rule. Try to be there within one year. And if not, no more than two years. Because remember, they're traveling on foot. They're going to many, many places. It's all of South India, for instance, at the time of St. John de Brito, there were eight priests. And these eight priests, most of them died after only a few years. And so they had to travel to hundreds and hundreds of places on foot, and they would visit many of them once only in two years, once only in one year. And they never knew when the, people were, when the priest was going to come because they didn't have telephones or faxes or emails. So the priest just came. And then when the priest came, they gathered together, they put the confessions, they did the baptisms, and they were part of the mission. Now, in our, in, in our situation since Vatican II, we have a crisis of faith. And in this crisis of faith, we're in an irregular situation. What that means is, we have missions three feet away from a parish. Normally, a mission is in one place, and a regular parish is in another. But in our case, like in the Aryan crisis, 1,600 years ago, there is the local parish run by the heretics, run by those that are not teaching the faith. And right next to the local parish is an irregular, unapproved mission. But this mission is run by St. Athanasius. This mission is run by St. Athanasius' priests. This mission is run by the priest, not by the people. And it is an irregular situation in that the, the actual 12-by-12-mile the actual, uh, 12 12 area happens to have three parishes in it that have been there for hundreds of years. Because remember, the Arian crisis already oh, was only 100 years that they had been there, but they'd been stable for 100 years. Everybody was already Catholic. Now they left the faith. Now they became Arian and followed Arius in his heresy. And now the Catholics had no church. And then St. Athanasius said, they have the churches, but we have the faith. And what is the parish essentially? It is essentially the place where the priest gives the faith the true Holy Roman Catholic faith to the faithful. And this is something which are called faithful, those filled with the faith. That's one reason why, in the previous times of the church, such as the Arian crisis, when these parishes, when these acting or missions were established, they were established alongside of parishes in which the parish had the Latin Tridentine Mass and the mission had the Latin Tridentine Mass. And the parish was run by a bishop and a priest who wore the exact same vestments as St. Athanasius wore and his priest wore. 
But why were, why were they in two different groups? Because the one that had the building that was built by Catholics, built by those very people who were no longer going to Mass there, that place was teaching Arianism. And therefore, the faith is more important than the buildings. The people went out, and they went into the catacombs in the very beginning with St. Peter and the Apostles. They went into all kinds of places and had the Mass, uh, and, and, but they were within a, in, in a setting with the parish priest. Now what has happened is one of the great problems or one of the effects of Vatican II. In Vatican II, one of the heresies or errors taught in Vatican II is that the faithful should have more to say in what happens in the church. And therefore it is recommended that there be parish councils and that the priest should not simply be dictating what happens in the church. There should be parish councils. And the parish councils were established. In fact, they tried to establish it immediately, even a long time ago in America. Bishop um, um, uh, Carroll in Baltimore, Maryland, in the 1700s, he tried to establish parish councils. And he wanted the priests to be elected by the people. And just like the Protestants do. That the priests should, people should have a heart to say, whether the, which priest is in the parish, what the priest does in the parish, and, that, and then aside from the doctrine of the faith, because he wasn't a heretic yet, he said, okay, you can't tell the priest what to preach, but everything else you can control. And so that you, you, should, you, you can't control the spiritual things, but you can control the other things, and there should be a parish council to control those things. Rome condemned it. And then I was when he was still Father Carroll. When he became Bishop Carroll, he became a dictator and a tyrant, and he changed his mind. He decided he was God over everything. But before he became Bishop Carroll, he was a great leader in making democracy the, the rule of the Catholic Church in America. That was in the late 1700s. And so the church condemned him for doing that, and he had to back down from it. They were not ready for that yet. The heresy and the error remained. It raised its head again in Vatican II. And that we're now we're going to have a, a, a grouping of faithful who will not be under the direction of the priest, who will not be in, in the parish or in the mission, and that the priest who comes in for the mission, he's not going to uh, run the mission, he's not going to control the mission, he's not going to decide what's going to happen with the mission, but rather he's just simply the spiritual father. This is, this is a conclusion or an effect of the heresy of the separation of church and state of the last few hundred years, and the belief that the spiritual and the material have no connection one to another. So that, you know, Father, you take care of the spiritual things, we'll take care of the material things. Because we're in charge of the material, you're in charge of the spiritual. But if you look at the average priest, you'll find that he has physical parts, such as eyeballs, nose, uh, feet, toes, hands, mouth, and, and so on. He has very similar physical parts, bodily parts, that every other human being has. He also takes up space. He also lives and breathes. He also is, it does, it has, has, the, has the, uh, all the requirements of human beings. Our Lord Jesus Christ was the same and he, when he became man. And then he handed down to his church that, they, that we are supposed to worship God, says St. Basil, not only with our hearts, not only with our minds. We must worship God with our bodies. Hence, we are obliged, in order to worship God, to build a physical building called a church where God is going to be worshipped. We are obliged to give physical money to the priests of God to support them in the work of God, in the work of, of uh, worshipping God. We are obliged to give time, such as our time of prayer. These are physical things. The, the mental thing, prayers you say, there's a certain amount of time you must put aside for worshipping God and for praying. And then we are obliged to operate in the society with our bodies, so that not only is the church a physical place of worship of God, but because God made the entire world, the church is the principal place, the principal physical place on earth for all human beings. So that kings must come to the church, and they also must worship God. When they receive their crowns, they must come before the bishop, and the bishop will put the crown upon their head. And the bishop will say, you are now the king, because as king you represent God. And who is the man of God? He's the bishop, he's the priest. And so the king must therefore also submit to the priest, and the, and the, and the, the, uh, the, the, the mayors and the magistrates must submit to the priest also, because he's the man of God. He does not tell them what to do in their own houses in every way. He only monitors, okay, if you're violating the law of God in your house, I tell you you're condemned. Because the priest has the right to enter the house. 
He has the right to enter the soul because he's of the spiritual things. But he doesn't have the right to, he doesn't control every detail of your life outside of the house, outside of the church, but he does have the right to reach inside because the law of God is there in your bedrooms. The law of God is there in your house. The law of God is there in parliament. The law of God is there in every single part of society. Therefore, the priest has his place in every part of society. Which is the reason why when they built Catholic towns, they built a big square. And on one side was the palace of the king. On the other side was the palace of the bishop and the cathedral. So that whenever the king was being a bad boy, the bishop didn't have to walk very far. He went right across the, the, the palace and he went, All right, king, you are breaking the law of God. You may make whatever laws you want that are in accord with the law of God. You may not make laws that are against the law of God. And if you make laws against the law of God, I excommunicate you. Because in the end, we human beings are one family. All of us. And we're all supposed to belong to the one Holy Roman Catholic Church. And like all members of a family, there's only one head. The invisible head is Christ. He is the invisible head of the state. And he is the invisible head of the church. He is invisible head also of the family. He's invisible head of every single aspect of society. The carpenter's workshop and the, 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 the little bitty lemonade stand on the corner. The little child has. He's invisible head of all these things. But he uses human uh, visible heads to monitor each one of them. Some of them belong to the state. And these are policemen, and they are lawyers and doctor lawyers, and, and they are the, um, the members of the state, the members of government, and these are supposed to operate according to the law of God. Others belong to the church, and they also are to operate according to the law of God. Now when the members of the state, and the, or the members of the church, or the members of both, turn against the law of God, it is the obligation of the faithful, the priest, and anyone else, no matter what, where they fit in the hierarchy, to stand up against this breaking of the law of God. And this particularly the immorality and the uh, errors, the, the teaching of errors. So what has happened since Vatican II, as the, the general problem has happened in many, many places inside of Catholic tradition. And what has happened is that we gave a lot of money to, for instance, here, to the, to the, in, in Australia, to the Tainong Church. We gave a lot of money to the local Adelaide Church. We gave a lot of money in America to St. Mary's, Kansas. We gave a lot of money uh, to, the, to the retreat house in Ridgefield. We gave a lot of money to this. We gave a lot of money to that. And then they went crazy. And before my daddy, he helped build St. Vincent Ferrer Church. And then they went modernist. So my daddy helped build St. Vincent Ferrer Church in the 1930s. And then they went modernist. Then we went and helped the Society of St. Pius X. And then they built uh, St. Isidore's Church, a church that I built in Colorado. And they built St. Isidore's Church, and then they went modernist. And then, they, then we built another place over there, they went modernist. This time, it's not going to happen again. This time, I'm going to make sure it doesn't happen again. I'm going to control my money, and I'm going to control myself, and I'm going to make sure that the priest that comes in, all right, Father, are you a good boy or are you a bad boy? Here's the list of what's required to be a good boy. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. You get a 72% that's passing in America, so you can come. You get 100%, we're going to give you a bonus. You get a 69%, that's failing. I'm sorry, Father, you're out of here. So that, so that, that, so that we, the priest gets a grade. Where do you fit? And these priests are actually referred to by St. Jerome, who mentioned multiple times, that they are like a, a street dog, he says, the priests that, that, that float around like this, and the priests that go to these type of places, they are street dogs. They are vagus dogs. And you see street dogs in the Philippines, street dogs in India, and so on. You notice that their head is always bowed down. They're scared of everything that moves. There are two things they never do. They never bark, and they never bite. You, just say they, you can kick them and run them away. Whenever they try to eat something in the field, always looking for someone to kick them, always looking for someone to, run, to make them run away. And yet they're dogs. And so when you see dogs in those places, you can run around and see 50 dogs. You won't be worried at all because none of them is going to bark and none of them is going to bite. They're street dogs. But if you have a dog that's owned, a dog that belongs to a house, a dog that has a territory, then you worry. You step into that dog's territory, he bites. You step by, you walk by that dog, he barks. But, 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 but the Saint, Saint Jerome says what happens to the priest when they lose their connection to the church, and what happens to the priest 
when they began to be run by the faithful, and this is the problem of the heresy of Caesarol Papism, that bishops are run this way, priests have been run this way, because the, because of the, ch the church is the, represents God and has great power over men. It is a place of ambition and a place of great corruption. This being the case, there are many, many men of the world who say, I want to have a control over that because the, the priest has great power. And therefore, I'm going to control the priest. And kings and dukes and lords down the last 2,000 years have tried to control the priest, including the pope. Pascal II, for instance, was a heretic, and his heresy was teaching that the lay people could control the church. And that, and then therefore they, he would, had to be condemned by his inferiors, and he had to back down from his false teaching. And so that when we look at the, the, the problem of the, the church, the church, because the priest represents God, he cannot, he cannot let the, he who represents man to step over him. Because remember what our Lord said in the gospel, when a priest walks by himself into a house, like St. Francis Xavier did and St. John de Brito, where no Catholic has ever stood for a long time or ever. He walks into a house, and he goes there the first time, and he meets nothing but pagans. What does he tell them? The kingdom of God is amongst you. That's what he says. The kingdom of God has arrived. Just as when Columbus, when Columbus arrived in America, he took the cross and he planted it on the ground in San Salvador. And he said, this land belongs to Christ. Now he just arrived. He didn't know how big it was, but no matter how big it was, it belongs to Christ. He planted the cross of Christ, and then he also declared it belongs to Spain. So he declared it belongs to Christ first, and to Spain second. He was not just a, uh, a man going to look for Japan, or look for the, to, get to, to get to India by the, by the other route. He was, he was bringing the kingdom of Spain with him, and he was bringing the kingdom of Christ with him. And his first desire was to implant the kingdom of Christ. Therefore, his first act was to take the cross and plant it on the ground and declare that this land, the whole of it, belongs to Christ. And so when we, when we travel around as priests, we, we travel as, um, as the ambassadors. An ambassador is an ambassador of the king. We travel as captains. We travel as the representatives of the kingdom of God. And we don't submit to the kingdom of men. We come by into the kingdom of God and then establish missions or establish parishes. Now these missions or parishes, they are missions of the supernatural type. Why do we gather together? We're gathering together today in a house. Why do we gather together? We're not gathering together in order to uh, have, a, what do you call it, a potluck dinner. We're gathering together to worship God in the Blessed Sacrament. We're gathering together to hear the word of God preached by the priest of God. We're gathering together to receive the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist and the sacrament of penance. Also baptism when it's needed and the sacrament of confirmation. And when the time comes, the sacrament of anointing and Catholic burial. All these things are why we are gathering. Now the buildings may be burnt down. The buildings may be closed. We may be driven out of the buildings. We may have to go back and say Mass in the catacombs as our ancestors did. St. Peter, the head of the Holy Roman Catholic Church, he never said Mass in a church ever in his life. He never saw a Catholic church. He never saw one. He never saw a Catholic building ever in his life. He didn't know what it looked like. He had no idea. He was just a pope. He was the head of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. He was the vicar of Christ. He said Mass in catacombs. He used a wooden portable altar. Parts of that altar are all rotted away and many little broken pieces are still in St. Peter's to this day. They keep the parts of St. Peter's altar. And it's there in St. Peter's Basilica. And, and so that his wooden altar, they had to pick down and put back up and take down and put back up. Saying Mass in the catacombs. Saying Mass in people's houses. Taking the altar down because the Romans are coming. And so... He, he, he ruled the Holy Roman Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is a society of persons united in faith who have professed that Catholic faith, who have the sacrament of baptism, and they are united in the hierarchy of our Holy Mother, the Church. And the buildings and the places are secondary. 
We want, the, we want there to be Catholic buildings everywhere in the world. We want all places to be under the dominion of our Lord Jesus Christ and His Holy Roman Catholic Church. But the essence of the church are human souls who are baptized, who profess the Catholic faith publicly, not secretly, who profess the Catholic publicly, who are united in the Holy Mother Church, which is a clerical and priestly church, just as the Old Testament operated through prophets and operated through the priests. That's the way God has always operated since he made Adam the first priest. And since the, and, and until the end of time, and in the New Testament, he made the 12 apostles priests, and he made the 72 disciples priests. The fullness of the priesthood and the episcopacy of the apostles and the priesthood and the 72 disciples. And he told them to go out and preach the gospel to the whole world and establish his faith everywhere in the world. So it doesn't matter how many times the priest comes. In the old missions, it was only once a year, once every two years. In fact, one of the decisions that I made back in 2012 is that we'll try not to go longer than seven or eight weeks without the Mass in any place or no longer than three months at the most, but seven or eight weeks would be the goal. Because the people aren't as strong as before. In the 1970s, we often and had many of our missions only had Mass once a year. Sometimes twice a year. And that was it. But they kept the faith strong and whole in between. But because of the crisis in the church today, because of how weak we are today, to go once a year or twice a year is not really going to be good. So therefore, it decided we're going to have to go more often than that to these missions. Even the small missions, we have to go more often than, than before. But, the, but, but, but they are missions. Missions in which the priest, who operates as a representative of the kingdom of God, controls the mission. Is not invited by the people. Not, uh, not a prayer group that invites this priest, invites that priest, invites another priest. But it is the priest who runs the mission. So each mission has a priest in charge of it. So there are priests that can come and visit and help. Priests that come, out, uh, that come and help. Other priests can come and visit and help. But they work with the priest in charge of the mission. Every mission is a priest in charge. Even in the old days. If the Dominicans went and built a church on 6th Street, the Franciscans didn't come in and say, we don't, we're, we're taking over your church because we don't feel like building one. The Franciscans came and they had to build their own church on 4th Street. And they had to set up their own parish on 4th Street. And then if the Jesuits came, they would build their own church. And then the diocese would come in and they would build their own church. And then, and then when it finally became a diocese, and then because of the divine power of the bishop, the Dominicans, the Franciscans, the Jesuits, would then put themselves as uh, under the authority of the bishop in the relationship of the people once it became a diocese. And so we are operating as missions, and as missions in the Catholic way, so that we still operate, we have to have our missions, unfortunately, next to our local parish, but because of the crisis of the church, we have no other choice. We're like in the time of the Arians. So we have missions. But the missions is the priest in charge. And the priest comes in and goes and, sa goes and says Mass in the mission. He goes out and says Mass in another mission. And then he has missions that he established. These missions are located wherever they're located. Now, in the past, for instance, in India, for instance, in the 1940s, when a priest was ordained, the normal parish would have at least 17 satellite missions. The average parish had an average of 17, some 20, some only 15 and the priest would be ordained in his parish, and then he would go and visit the missions. Same thing in the Philippines, same thing in the United States. There's a parish, and then there's missions established to the parish. So that the parish is satellite missions. As it grows, one of the missions will eventually turn into a parish itself. And another mission will eventually turn into a parish. So that in the beginning, there's missions only. Then a mission is turned into a parish. And then missions are made part of a parish. And then another mission becomes a parish. And eventually, almost all the missions become parishes. And, and, uh, but the idea, of course, is that there will be continual spreading of the faith and always missions connected to parishes and, that the, and uh, satellite missions. In our world today, because of modern travel, we can have missions very far from each other. In olden times, missions would be within 20, 30, 40, 50 miles. And now the missions can be all over the world. But with regard to the missions, remember, the hierarchy of the church remains and that it's a divine hierarchy. The faithful are under the priest. The priest under the bishop, the bishop under the pope, and everyone under the pope, and everyone under Christ. And so we, we all, we all uh, operate in this way. And the, the, to operate another way is to operate other than the way than the church was founded by Christ. And that's something because it's a matter of faith we can't accept. It's called the heresy of Caesaropapism, or lay investiture, by which the king, duke, or lay lord would decide who the priest was, put him in charge, put him in the alt, in the place, tell him, you can preach whatever spiritual sermons you want, Father, but these are our rules and regulations, how we operate. 
And so, but but remember that by Saint Clement the Second said, or Pope Clement the Second said, remember that the 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 priest must run the, the the clerical matters, all those things connected with the clerical things. And so we must remember in our little battle of the faith that we're in an irregular situation in that we don't have the normal parish churches, but in the churches, the priest is still the charge of the mission. And the mission is the mission, where the priest says the Mass. Why do we gather together? For the Mass. Why do we gather together? For the faith. Why are we not at the other place? Because of the faith, because of the Mass. And so it's a faith in the Mass that brings us together, the faith in the Mass is taught by the priest. If the priest teaches a false faith, then you step away and establish a new mission. And God will send another priest. And then we establish a new mission. But in whatever the mission is, it should be run by the priest. And this is part of also the divine natural law. That in the spiritual things and, the, and those things are any connect, connected, the priest is in charge. So that whether it's a Saint Vicantus priest or a Novus Ordo priest or a uh, priest of the Catholic tradition, uh, or any doesn't matter. Or the priest runs the mission. So when, when I was in the Society of Saint Pius X mainstream before they expelled me illegally and, and improperly, I built churches and worked with the society in the Society of Saint Pius X under Bishop Fillet. I still consider myself under Bishop Fillet to this very day. But I but if he says. You can't say mass in this building. That's it. I can't say mass in that building. He's the one in charge. When he says that you know that uh, you know the you, you can't preach in this building, I can't preach in that building. So therefore, I'll preach somewhere else. I'll continue doing the work of Christ in another place. Uh, but uh, I, the uh, the divine hierarchy made him the one in charge of the building, one in charge of the place. And if he abuses that high, that that power, well, anyone can abuse their power. Fathers abuse their power. Kings abuse their power. Uh, priests abuse their power. Anyone can abuse their power. And that we have to uh, stand up against any abuses that have to do with the faith or grave immor immorality. And the, otherwise, we endure those things for our sanctification. So the, uh, the, but we, we, the church does give us answers of what to do when a priest or a bishop or a pope abuses his power. If it has to do with the faith, we must, we must separate. If it has to do with immorality, we must try to stop it. Uh, or and it depends on the, what the immorality is. Well, we must not approve of it in any case. And then if, and if we're asked to do something immoral, we're obliged to disobey. But we can't take the place of the bishop or take the place of the priest or take the place of the pope. But we must continue to work to spread the faith and uh, stand firm with that faith and maintain this uh, order of the church. In any case, we'll close it to that. And God bless you all, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.